Welcome to the Elevate Media Podcast with your host, Chris Anderson. In this show, Chris and his guests will share their knowledge and experience on how to go from zero to successful entrepreneur. They have built their businesses from scratch and are now ready to give back to those who are just starting. Let's get ready to learn, grow, and elevate our businesses. And now your host, Chris Anderson. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to improve our copywriting in our business, bring in more business, and also hear the story and the journey of an individual who went from starting his business at 23 to becoming a millionaire by 26. Found out today he's also a fellow Hoosier. So both of us from Indiana, which is really cool. So excited to dive into this topic and to his story. We got Troy Erickson on the show today. Troy, welcome to Elevate Media Podcast. Hey, what's up, Chris? Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, rare to see other Hoosiers out in the wild, but we do exist. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So I'm excited to dive into this because you know, there's always room for me personally to improve copywriting wise. But just for audience, I think that's sometimes like a topic that people think about. They're like, and they see it as like this huge obstacle and skill that they need to learn. And so to dive into that a little bit, I'm excited as well as your journey because 23 to 26, being a millionaire at 26, that's a pretty awesome feat that a lot are striving to is trying to get there. So, but first, before we dive into all that, I got a little icebreaker question for you. I've been trying to do with guests just to lighten the mood a little bit and have some more fun with it. So for you, what was the worst haircut or hairstyle you ever had? Oh my gosh. I'm experimenting right now because I'm getting married soon. But I would Congrats. say I, about a year ago, I tried that thing where it was like uh, a lot of people have long hair on the top and short on the sides uh-huh. and the back. Uh-huh. But it, it was almost like the mullet where it's like short on the sides, but it's long uh, on top and in the back. And like I saw some baseball players doing it. I was like, oh, that's really cool. So I think it was like a couple years ago, actually. And then looking back, I'm like, oh, that just didn't look good. That's funny. Yeah, I can understand that. Bringing, uh, my brother-in-law did the mullet while he was in college for a little bit. And my, I guess, I never really did anything crazy. I guess the one thing I did was just kind of let it grow a little bit. It wasn't even that long, but like my hair gets like wavy and like weird curly. And so like, it was still medium length, but it just looked bad. It looked like, like I had a bull, bull cut with longer on this. I was just, yeah. Other than that, I just buzzed my hair, buzzed my head growing up. And so I just now decided, yeah, I've got hair. Might as well try to keep it and keep it managed. To not mess it up. Right. You're right. <laughs> so, oh, uh, that's cool, man. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So what got you into copywriting? Like why that as a business? Yeah. So the biggest thing I kind of briefly mentioned baseball, but like I was a college baseball player at Cedarville University in Ohio. So not too far from home, about four hours. And I had some mental complications called the yips that kind of like mm-hmm. literally prevented me from throwing a baseball because in high school I had an arm surgery. Okay. And like at the time, my identity was baseball. It was like that or nothing. And as a senior in college, I got cut from my team because I could no longer throw a baseball because I had so many like mental lapses stemming from the surgery and childhood traumas and things like that. That's a whole nother story. But I had to do something else. Otherwise, I was going to have to go get a nine to five. That was the last thing everyone. Unfortunately for me, when things work going well in baseball and the end was near, hmm. I was on Snapchat of all places. And somebody was like, hey, swipe up if you want to make money on the internet. And I was like, this kind of seems like a scam. It seems like my parents would hate this. <laughs> but let me swipe up and just make sure it's a scam so I can leave and write this off. So swiped up. And actually, the guy was really helpful. He was like giving <laughs> tips about how, how to sell stuff on eBay and eventually how to run Facebook ads and do all this advanced stuff. So soon enough, there was a course that came out. And <laughs> guess who bought it for a thousand? So I did that. And turns out I followed the course that, like it told me and I was successful. Like a lot of people just don't like do all the necessary stuff to make it work. But yeah, for reference, the guy's name was Grant Cooper and he was running an agency called Social Vantage and they had a lot of big name clients. And I was running some ads for like Orange Theory locations and mm-hmm. such. I learned Facebook ads and it came down to the summer of 2019. I basically had two clients. And one of them wanted to fire me. So I was like, hey, why? I'm looking at the cost per lead on Facebook. It looks fine. They're like, no, we have to fire you. And I said, why? Like, tell me the truth. And they're like, all right, fine. 
our emails are going to spam and we're not making any money off the leads that you're getting us. So I said, I don't know much about this, but I'm going to figure it out for you for free. And then once I fix it, we'll go back to you paying me. Is that fair? And then they like checked with corporate and they're like, all right, fine. If it's free, we'll do it. So I had a little bit of email experience from my other client. So I went ahead and I signed into their ESP, which is active campaign. And their emails were really bad and they were only sending like one per week and they were going to spam. So through the course of like buying some other info products, again, the courses work amazingly well if you follow them. Yeah. I was able to get them out of spam, write emails that kind of made sense and send more of them. And over the course of that summer, they went from 13K a month from their email list to 51K a month, which is almost a 4X. <laughs> so I was like, I should probably do this for more people and get out of this red ocean of Facebook ads. Because yeah. at the time, everybody was running them. And it's a little different now. But still to this day, there's not that many people doing like full email list management and copywriting and all that stuff. So I've done it ever since. And I pretty much just built an entire agency around it. Went to a lot of events, met a lot of good people. And I also kind of added an emphasis on email deliverability because it's mm -hmm. huge for people. So still what I do to this day. And then we also have a certification program. That's awesome. That's really cool. I always like hearing people's Stories and like what got them started, the connections and the, the like, and that's entrepreneurship. You see a need and you feel it. And that's what you did. You pivoted in a moment that some people could have just given up. And that's really cool. So like in today's market, a lot, we've went through a lot the last handful of years, pandemic, recession type stuff, all sorts of things going on in the world. Have you seen copywriting change at all in the last, whatever, five years or so? Yeah, so I wasn't even into it. Like, well, I mean, technically I was into copywriting five years ago. I just didn't really know what it was. Right. Because I kind of got my feet wet for like my mom's business in maybe 2016. And like 2017, 18, it was like experimentation. And 2019 is when it got serious. But yeah, the changes that I've seen, two types of changes. So the first one is like internal. So really just understanding like what is copy and what is the actual point of this. And really getting to know the fact that it's not just the copy it's a, like all the elements around the copy and understanding like the strategy of the business because that dictates what kind of copy you're going to write like what is the level of the awareness of the person you're writing to and then understanding like okay copy is no longer just like words are thrown out there that's why most people are bad at it because they just don't have any clue what to say it's mm -hmm. a formula, right? So like the very first thing is I want to like mention a problem in a relatable. So for example, if you were trying to get on podcasts, let's say, and I started off my message, like getting on podcasts is a great way to get your name out there. Like that's how most people start. Mm -hmm. it just, it's what they see on like blog posts and set. Right. But if I go ahead and I tell a relatable story about the time that I was struggling to get on a podcast and I like... I use real elements that other people can relate to while still talking about the problem specifically. That is what it's going to grab somebody's attention because they know you've been there. You can't mm -hmm. smell or I mean, they can smell when you're being fake, right? Right. So you just have to make sure you're telling like real relatable stories that like have a problem that you and I have in common or that I used to have and that you currently have. So, yeah. And as far as what to do next, you lead a little bit more into the problem and talk about the solution and kind of tease a little bit. And then you tell more about like your discovery story. So like mm -hmm. you have a little more info on like how you solve the problem. And then at the end, you offer that solution to them. So that was more like me discovering copy. And then as far as changes to it these days, I mean, AI is the biggest one. So in the last roughly six months, AI has come on by storm. And for uh, some people who have just heard of AI, they kind of panic because they think like, oh, no, I'm a copywriter. My job <laughs> is at stake. But what I've come to notice over the last several months of AI being out and having it be a thing that I could actually go use, I've kind of figured out that it's more of a research tool than anything, right? So I can go into chat GPT, which is free, by the way. Anybody can use it. You can go there and much like Google, ask it any kind of question. But it's going to give you different answers than Google. It's like more thought out answers and it knows yeah. answer to almost anything. So you can go plug in any question you have and you can ha tell it to give you like examples of certain situations. So for example, with the, what I talked about earlier, I could go into chat GPT and I could type in like, give me five reasons that people struggle to get on podcasts to advertise their business. And it will give you five reasons and you can literally just grab one of those reasons and 
like go write the copy that I was talking about, right? Yep. Now, as far as what it writes, it's not going to sound superhuman, at least not yet. Right. It's still kind of going to sound like a blog post where it's just kind of gives you like extra information that you don't <laughs> yeah. really need and that most people scroll past. You mm. just have to be good at picking out the pieces that are really good and making like better transitions that are more relatable and more like customized to your audience. Cool. Yeah. And it's definitely, I don't know, like we're going to see some more changes with AI and how it's implemented and things like that. But psychology, thinking of it from that direction, like with a hook, is there things you can do uh, that increases your chances of, say, people opening an email versus others? I know you kind of gave a, an example earlier of tying it into an example, but are there other certain ways to hook people into things? You love listening to podcasts, but have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Maybe you want to build a brand, grow your business, or are looking for an excuse to talk about your favorite hobby. Whatever your reason for making a podcast, Buzzsprout is the place to start. Since 2009, Buzzsprout has helped over 300,000 people launch their own podcasts. Buzzsprout walks you step-by-step -step through the whole process and will give you powerful tools to start, grow, and monetize your podcast. Ready to get started? Click the link in the show notes to get our free step-by-step -step guide to starting your podcast today. Yeah, for sure. So we'll actually, let's go over hooks and subject lines because it's a little sure. bit different. Okay. Because uh, at a 50,000 foot bird's eye view, you have to like have the offer for the business down pat first. Mm -hmm. For example, like with my certification program or really anytime I'm teaching somebody, most of the time I'm talking to copywriters specifically. So with that kind of person, a copywriter is typically writing, what they do is they close a client, they don't get paid up front, they have to go into a Google Doc and spend like hours and hours writing copy, maybe a little less now because AI, mm -hmm. but then when they finish, they go and they turn into the client. And a lot of times the client is like, oh, this is great. We'll get back to you later. And a lot of times they get ghosted. Sometimes mm -hmm. they don't get paid or sometimes it takes a long time to get paid or for the client to actually use the copy they wrote. Even if it's email, like it's so messy and complicated and it can be really stressful. And you spend all your time trying to get money out of people or like trying to tweak things. And they ask you for 10 edits mm -hmm. and you try all this stuff. And you don't have time to go close more clients. Right. So that's, those are some of the real life problems that I would talk about in the top of my copy. And I do talk about those things. So the hook basically is like, hey, if you're a copywriter and you are writing in Google Docs and sending copy off to clients and they kind of ghost you and they don't pay on time, why don't you just become an email list manager where the client pays you up front, they let you into their ESP and you just write and send the emails on the spot and you're getting paid up front. And by the way, this is more helpful to the business owner because you can also help them with email deliverability and strategy. So like a hook is not necessarily like a, an elaborate, like well-written piece of copy. A hook is more like, what is the big idea of what you're selling? Gotcha. And then you can take that big idea and like put it into a sentence or a paragraph that is more catchy, right? Now with subject lines, that's going to be a little bit different because by the time somebody's seeing your emails and seeing your subject lines and all that, they've somehow been introduced to you, right? Because otherwise they wouldn't be on your email list. So they right. probably already read the sales letter or they opted in somewhere. Or they've heard of you in some way, shape or form. So with subject lines, I'm just grabbing the best bits and pieces from my like main hub, which I'll say is a sales letter, for instance, or a video or something like my main piece of copy. So I'm just going to grab the best pieces from that as like mini hooks. And let's say one of the biggest things there is like the part about getting paid upfront on retainer. So I could grab a subject line from that. It's like how to go from uh, I'll pay you later to 5K a month upfront. Something like that, right? Like, and yeah. I could make it a little bit shorter. And then maybe I could go into the other part that is talking about like when the client takes forever to review your work. I'd be like, clients taking forever, read this. And it's different, like little mini hooks that you can grab from the main like hub, the main letter, the main video, whatever. And you just test all of them and you send those out as subject lines. And you'll find that some of those mini hooks are more appealing than others. And you should stick to those, not just in your emails, but like every time you write about your business or offer. Cool. 
that's a good way to do it is, is, is taking it from the main thing and then testing. I think that's a big one is testing different things to see what work. Like we've been just with like our social media and things like that, testing different kind of formats of micro video as well as captions and like titles on YouTube shorts and things, just playing around with it to just see what gets more traction. And I think that really is beneficial, especially even with copywriting, because you'll see, especially if you're growing a list that is around your audience that you're trying to sell to, what kind of sits with them well or what resonates with them better than other things. So that's a great point. Yeah. One of the easiest things you can do too is you can do this on email or social media or wherever. Make this as short as possible. Otherwise, people will go on tangents and not answer your question. But you literally just say like, hey, if I'm talking to email marketers, I'm going to say like, hey, what's your number one question about email marketing? Or what's your number one problem about email marketing? And literally just say that and then say like, reply and let me know. That's it. Just say that. And then people will reply and they'll start to tell you things and you'll start to notice that some of those are in common. And it just gives you really good feedback and data. And it's just really nice because it's like a human element. And a lot of businesses don't have it these days because they don't actually, it's not someone who's actually going to read your response and reply. But when you do that, you learn a lot about people. That's a great point. And I think, yeah, I think that's huge. Collecting data from those you're trying to serve, like just to see what they truly need. It's like when you see people trying to start a business from scratch and they're just, uh, they just say, I'm going to make this course or I'm going to make this thing because I think it sounds good or I think people will like it instead of like actually figuring out if that's what people want. I think I've made the mistake when I first started out and, and I know a lot of others do. So I think, yeah, collecting that data and getting a good pulse on uh, what your people need and what your people want will almost streamline the process kind of. Yeah, totally. And that's something that you just have to make adjustments on the fly for. There's not really any marketers that nail it the first time. Right. <laughs> uh, so for example, like I just bought a software called MailGenius.com where people can get like go spam test their emails. And I'm trying to like figure out upsells right now. And it's like, it's a process. And like right now I don't have it dialed in, but in yeah. like I kind of have a plan. And, and the key is when you're struggling with this, the number one thing to remember, people want more of the same. So if they bought something in the past, The next thing you should sell them is either more of that thing or something that's like very similar or like builds on top of that thing or is like in some way touching the first thing that they bought or the first thing that they opted in for. So that's just kind of always what to resort back to when you're stuck. Like what worked in the past? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. Keeping it linear, keeping it streamlined instead of trying to go do a whole new thing. I think that's a good takeaway there for sure. Because yeah, if you can tie it right into it, like we're building some stuff out that that plays off of our offer. And so it's like, it just makes sense for that being the next step based on what people have reached out to a lot about. And so, yeah, just, it almost takes, you don't have to think on it so much because they're doing that for you by giving you that response. Yeah, totally. It's just looking at data because a lot of times people, they don't know what to tell you. And you can ask them and some people give you good answers, but some people just don't know or they're shy to reply. So what you can look at is their behaviors because actions speak louder than words. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so true. And 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 then it goes back to your first point of testing then. Then you get some handful of kind of the same response and then testing different things within that to see what kind of gets traction or takes hold as you're building out. So are there, and yeah, I'm curious on this because uh, obviously copywriting is not my focus or anything. Are there like certain words you should or shouldn't use in like your hooks or in your copy that could deter people? Yeah. And again, that's research too. figure out what people mm-hmm. don't like. Yeah. For example, a lot of my students, like I'm starting a mastermind soon as well for some of my students who have really excelled and kind of showing them how to make it to the next level. So it, this is really interesting as I ask them, I'm like, hey, what kind of business do you want to have beyond copywriting? And I had a bunch of options in there. One of them was not many people click that box, probably because a lot of people have a bad connotation with agencies and they think that agencies like don't do anything. But then the next day I had one in there that was like, hey, like, would you be interested in having a high ticket offer? Like everybody clicked that one. Yeah. And then I look back, I'm like, wait a minute, what's the difference between an agency and a high ticket? Right. <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm like, it's all in the wording. Just figure out what your audience wants. So yeah, it's really just understanding that in other contexts, you like for compliance, like if you're writing Facebook ads, you got to be careful using the word you. 
because you can't like imply anything about your audience like oh you need to lose weight because that could like make somebody feel bad apparently so yeah or like you could make 10k a month just you got to be careful with that but even though the word you works because it's more direct and it speaks to the person reading because if you don't use the word you it's like they their brain kind of goes to like oh okay so other people have that problem i'm glad yeah. that i don't even if <laughs> they do have that problem right and then of course in email there's certain words that could trigger like spam or the promotions tab and a lot of people ask me what those oh, okay. words are but every it's going to be different for most people because everybody has different domain reputation so based on your like previous mm-hmm. sending history with your domain so like for example one of my domains is emailparamedic.com so if i have a good sending history there then I can get away with a lot more. Whereas if I have a bad sending history or if I'm a new sender, then I can't get away with as much. And that's why I bought a tool like Mail Genius to kind of help you discover what some of those words could be. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't even realize that was kind of a thing of having issues as a new sender or someone who doesn't send a lot that you, the words you use in like the hook, I'm guessing, or in the title, in the subject line, excuse me, could cause you to go to spam more than others. Yeah, there definitely are. And it's funny. It's not just the subject line either. Sometimes the body content in the email. Like I've had clients before when I first started working with them, they didn't have a great domain reputation. And I was writing for a biz op company once. I used the word alarm clock and Hmm. that pushed it into the promotions tab. And I was like, what the heck? So it's a lot of experimentation that goes on with it. And I have other ways to avoid the promotions tab as well. But that's like the one that I started out with. And it was a headache, like guessing and checking which word it was. Yeah. But yeah. I'm trying to make that process easier for people just Interesting. Uh, with Mail Genius. So, yeah. So, how can they improve their domain, their sending record, or whatever it is to lower those chances? And I know you, there's a lot to it, I'm sure, but there, is there anything practical that they could start looking at or being careful around to? Improve? Yeah. So, to keep it really simple, if you're not like an email pro, is just really getting good engagement, right? So, it, right. it's very simple. It's everybody's familiar with social media algorithms. Right. Well, there's one with email too. <laughs> so, if I send you an email, there's good things you can do and there's bad things you can do. So, good things would be opening the email, clicking a link in the email, replying to the email, favoriting it, forwarding it to somebody, whitelisting it so it can't go to spam, things like that. Mm-hmm. And the bad things you could do are like delete it right away before you <laughs> read it or you can yeah. mark it as spam, unsubscribe, not open the email you know it's not like you have to open every day but like if you never open that's not good Mm -hmm. Uh, so whatever you get somebody to do it's either going to be good or bad right so in today's day and age post ios 15 you usually want to see like 20 percent open rates or more and what it comes down to sure you gotta have like enticing subject lines and whatnot and you have to avoid the promotions tab and the spam folder and that's a little more advanced stuff but it's really important and the last thing I'll say too is like your content. A lot of people, and again, I'll relate this to social media, they'll make posts on Facebook and they'll be like, oh, I think the algorithm is hurting me. And I'm like looking at their content. It's like, no, your content's just not very good. People don't want to read it. And Mm. same thing goes for email. One of the reasons people might stop opening is if your message isn't congruent to what they opted in for and what they expected. Yeah. So Whatever they opted in for or purchased, you got to keep talking about things that are similar to that. You have to get very personal, which is sometimes hard, but you have to like talk about the re- like the actual struggles of somebody in their position or like the struggles that you went through because nobody wants to hear you just brag all day long about yourself. They right. want to hear something relatable and like then you can talk about the successes you've had because they want to know that, okay. This person is similar to me. They had the same problem that can relate to them and they made it out and succeeded. They made it out of the problem and now they're successful. And I believe I can do the same now. Yeah. So it's kind of the basic things that you should be doing to get more engagement. That's, I mean, that's really good advice and direction there. And a lot of people focus solely or majority of their time on their social media. They're posting there and they're trying to improve that because the algorithm, like you said, and I feel like emails at least nowadays, you're kind of put onto the kind of the side a little bit more. But if you can focus on the, from what I'm getting from you right now and what I'm taking in is if you can approach the emails like you approach your social media or you should be at least content that ties directly into what you do, keeping that that linear focus. So having that in the email body and then you've got to draw them in somehow, whether it be that, that split second in your social media post where it's like the title and a, something that grabs their attention. So in the subject line, same kind of thing and not doing the bait and switch type thing. I think like if we can look at them similarly together and 
maybe that's something I haven't tried. And I just it kind of popped in my head is taking some social media posts that have done really well and then formatting them in a way that fits the email and sending that. Yeah, hundred percent. You should be like reposting things, not in the way of like copy paste. I'm done. I don't have to do this yeah. anymore. I saved a bunch of time kind of that kind of way, but more just like, again, like whatever worked in the past, you should be replicating it on all the other platforms. And yeah. anytime you talk to somebody and they say something that's like insightful, whether they're your audience or somebody you look up to, like you should a hundred percent be reusing that in some capacity. That's awesome. Yeah, that's so true. And it's, it sparked some ideas in my head on how I want to improve going forward. So I hope the listeners are getting the same thing they should. It's been a great, a lot of value. And I, you mentioned the human aspect and being transparent and things like that, because not everyone wants to see you brag all the time. So for you and your journey, three years from 23 to 26 million, that's awesome. Like it's, that's fantastic. I love seeing success in people's lives like that. But what if, what were, what was maybe one huge obstacle that you remember that you had to get through to get to the success that you've seen that you're thankful for now because it made you better thinking back on your journey what was one moment that you're like am i going to do this like can i get past this kind of thing yeah i would say first of all i, I briefly mentioned this i could write a whole book about it uh, like my life was baseball at one point and that was my identity and then one day that was stripped away from me for a lot of like mental and emotional and physical reasons and also my own lack of performance and it hurts to realize that, that you, something you thought you were going to do the rest of your life. And one day you just get told, Hey, you're not any good at this anymore. Sorry, mm -hmm. go do something else. And I tried my butt off to like make it back elsewhere, but COVID happened, kind of got distracted. I just went and I sat down and I was like, I don't know where I go from here. Um, luckily for me, I went to an event like right before the world, like shut <laughs> down and I met some people. So when COVID happened. I went and I just like started hitting up all these people that I knew and I didn't care how long it took, but like sometimes you feel stuck because you don't know where to go next or who to talk to. But the truth is in that situation, this is what held me. It just means you haven't had enough conversations yet. But if you're struggling right now and you like can't find the right person who can help you or you can't find a client or whoever, it just means you haven't had enough conversations. You know somebody who needs help, and that doesn't mean reach out to them and instantly pitch them. <laughs> Just like go to their website and find something that you can help them with that they're currently not doing correctly and just make a Loom video, like a screen recording video and record it and send it to them and find somebody else, record it and send it to them and do that as many times as you can. If you dry up your lead base, that just means that you aren't being active on social media. So like go in a Facebook group that's directly about the problem that you solve or directly like the group of people, the type of people that you help and do the same thing there. Just like go find people and go do it over and over. So, cause it's like, I was starting out and it's like the world was shut down. Everybody's worried, but I had this whole network of people that I could tap into. And that's really how I got started. And yeah, there's other things that have come up on the way, different things change with email, different compliances change, especially like in the deliverability space. At one point I had to, I thought I had to shut down my entire offer, but I found a way to just like pivot around it and think outside the box. Like mm -hmm. what if I could do it this way? Mm -hmm. I know nobody's ever done it this way before, but what if I could? And you yeah. just think about that as much as you can, the new way of doing things that you want to try and just go try it. Like mm -hmm. nobody's watching you. You can literally just go on your own computer at home and try anything you want to try. And then once you feel like it works, then you can go out and like test it and see if people like it. So it's really just a matter of like not being afraid to talk to people and not being afraid to try new things. I love that. And it's so true. You got to be able to pivot and think outside the box and put yourself out there sometimes to quote unquote fail. But I mean, those learning lessons are the things that really elevate and expand what we do a lot faster that and of course, having more conversations like you mentioned. So thank you for being open, transparent about sharing those obstacles and overcoming those. As we kind of wrap, wrap up this up, here's a couple more questions that I would like to ask. And they're not necessarily on the topic of copywriting, but more on your journey and just with you as a person. If you could spend an hour or two over lunch, whatever, with an individual and just learn from, them, just ask them questions, just hear about their story, dead, alive, or fictional, who would you choose and why? I'd probably put God, first of all, because it's like, there's the answer to like everything that you'd ever want to know. But if it was like a living person, I would probably, oh my goodness. 
I'd probably say like Tom Brady, honestly, because he's one of okay. I, I know being from Indiana, that's not the answer people want to hear. <laughs> it's like worth work ethic wise, like he became my role model as a kid for a reason, even though it wasn't mm. the same sport. Yeah. Uh, gosh, not living person, probably my grandparents, but if it yeah. was like somebody I, I didn't know, I don't know, maybe like a blanket or somebody. Like, a really cool uh, uh, throwback. Yeah, that's awesome. And a fun fact, he is a distant great uncle of mine. So, really? just another, yeah, my dad does that genealogy stuff. So he tracks all that stuff. It's crazy. But yeah, no, yeah, I, I like that. I think, and it's funny. So, for those who know, I batch record episodes and the first Tuesday of every month. And today, three people I've asked that question to, three out of the six have said either Jesus or God. And I just think that's fascinating. I think it's really a cool thing. So, so yeah, thank you so much for sharing who you would speak to, Troy. And as we wrap up, if you could talk to someone who's just starting on their journey of entrepreneurship, what would be one word of advice you'd give them? Yeah, I think it goes back to earlier, just like go talk to as many people as you can right now who are doing what you want to do. And I still do that to this day. Like I said, I'm building a software and right now. I'm on the hunt for people who have like successfully built and exited software companies. And that's all I'm going to do. Just talk to those people. But like when you're starting out, it's simple. Like figure out what you want to do like go on youtube and find out what you enjoy and don't spend too much time there because once you kind of figure it out you and two or three things you want to do you got to go try it like don't be in watch mode forever that's where people get stuck and all of a sudden they're old and they can't do anything more because they spent their whole life watching yeah watching other people do the things they want to do so figure out two or three things and then actually go implement those things and talk to more people have more conversation Go find people that have a problem with their website that you can fix if it falls in one of those categories that you enjoy. So being able to do that and just like build your network, like people will notice that stuff. Just understand that like you're, when people recognize you, like that compounds, right? So like day one, you start, nobody knows you. Nobody's going to recognize you. Right. But if you go out and you contact five people that day and you contact five every single day, it just doesn't go like five, 10, 15. A year from now, you're going to literally be known by thousands of people. Maybe not top of mind, but you're going, your network is potentially thousands of people because the people that you help early on, they tell other people about you. So it's not linear. It's like exponential, right? Have some conversations today and just do things, right? So like learn what you like, go do the things and start contacting people right away. Love it. And solid information, everybody. So If anything, at least take that from today. He shared a lot more great nuggets, but start talking to people. Get out there and expand. So, Troy, thanks again so much for being on Elevate Media Podcast today. Where can people go find you and connect with you and learn more about what you do? Yeah, so as you could probably guess, I'm going to say email. (laughs) Best place to get on my list, if you're like a beginner, kind of interested in like what I do, makemoneytypingemails.com is probably the best place to go. If you already have a business and you kind of want to learn like what to do in email marketing, then faqemail.com. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. So make sure you check out guys, wherever you're at, check those out, get connected with Troy and yeah, just improve where you're at. Again, Troy, thanks so much for being on today. Yeah. Thank you as well. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Elevate Media Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. See you in the next episode.